morning, everybody. My name is Rich Abley, uh, a frequent presenter here, as some of you know, at Ollie. Uh, thank you all for being here and bringing your friends and guests. I'm delighted to have been asked to come back and share another international adventure with all of you. This one here was a very special trip that I did 11 years ago. As some of you know, I have a history of Antarctic exploration in my family. And I said, decided one day that it was time to get up to the Arctic and see if I could get to the North Pole because I knew one of my eventual goals was to get to the South Pole, which you've already seen on one of my earlier presentations. This particular trip in 08 was after 10 years of watching this icebreaker go every summer to the North Pole and the price tag kept going up $1,000 a year. And so it started at about uh, $12,000 in 1998, and then it went to 13,000 and 14 and 15, and it got all the way up to 2007, and it was that then over $20,000. And I said, the price tag keeps going up and it's gonna get unaffordable, so I better go. <laughs> so I finally did the bullet, found some loot, and decided to go. And this was an extremely special trip because the icebreaker that we took, the one on the lower left, the 50 Years of Victory, was spanking brand new. She was only two months old. And uh, it was only her second time up to the North Pole. She had already been there two weeks earlier. So let's, let's find out about what this trip is all about. Uh, <clears throat> I went with an organization called Cork Expeditions. And basically, uh, we had to fly into Germany and then Germany up to Finland to Helsinki and that's where we all met. And uh, we spent the night there and then hopped in a chartered 737 and flew to Murmansk. And Murmansk, you can see, is right there. Um, that is a uh, ice-free port during the uh, winter times. And our convoys, many of you know from World War II, used to go from Argentia, Newfoundland, and the west, east coast of, uh, of the U.S. over to um, Iceland and then Iceland on to Murmansk to drop off supplies for the uh, embattled uh, Russian armed forces. So Murmansk happens to be the, uh, the main center for all the icebreakers that operate in Russia and they have the world's largest fleet. They have about five or six nuclear icebreakers and about 12 more conventional icebreakers for a total of around 18. We have, in our inventory in the United States, we have one and a half. Yes, we have a, well, maybe two and a half. The Healy and the Polar Star. And they're both very old. And we finally, the U.S. Coast Guard let out a contract just last summer for the construction of three more, which won't be ready for five years. So we're way behind in icebreakers in the U.S., but the Ruskies have got the world's largest fleet of them and there's a good reason for it because they've got the most coastline in the Arctic that needs that support. So in Murmansk is where we all flew into and let's go take this journey and find out what happened. So here we are arriving in Murmansk and would you believe it was a hot spell. They were having a huge heat, heat uh, uh, period here and folks were wearing shorts and t-shirts that had never been worn before. So you saw a lot of white skin. There was absolutely nobody with a sunburn or tan. And this is a old, old Soviet city. And you can see the typical square, you know, very simple <coughs> drab construction of the Soviet era. And restaurants and hotels were just being introduced into Murmansk in the, around the early 2000s. So this is what it looked like there. Uh, this is a monument to the Russian uh, uh, soldier Alyosha, one of the defenders of the Soviet polar area during the Great Patriotic War. This is what they call World War II. It's the largest monument north of the Arctic Circle. We are well north of the Arctic Circle in this particular location. And the flame at the base there burns 24-7. And you can see the person on the lower right in reference to how tall that structure is. You know, when the Soviets build, they build big. And this thing is absolutely Wow. And there's the flame burning. Uh, that lady on the lower right, I hadn't met her yet, and I met her on the ship. And she became a roommate of another lady that I met on the ship, and they both wound up going to the South Pole with me three years later. So we wound up becoming 
bipolar explorers, <laughs> starting with this particular exploration. So it was amazing. The day before, a storm had just come through Murmansk and it let everything down, despite the heat, and uh, it just made the uh, gold on the top of these Russian Orthodox churches just gleam in the sun. Yeah, very, very pretty. Uh, this is a, a typical large uh, uh, nautical um, anchor, and there's a chief petty officer and a sailor there admiring the uh, display up here on the outskirts of Murmansk. So we go down to the port in a bus, and there's two or three buses with all of us on board. We had a couple, 300 folks on this icebreaker, and the guide says, no cameras, no pictures. Can't take any pictures in the port until you get on the ship. And when you get on the ship, you can turn around and take all the photos you want. It makes no sense. I mean, if you can't take a photo from the pier looking at the ship, but you get on the ship, you can take all the photos you want. And then right behind us was a huge Soviet aircraft carrier. And that aircraft carrier you're gonna see in a moment, take all the pictures you want because we've been taking pictures of it from satellites for years. So here's the 50 years of victory. Notice she entered service just one month before I got on her in July, and uh, there's her length. She's really long, over 500 feet. Huge draft, that's the depth from the water line down to the bottom of the ship. 21 knots. What's unique is she's got twin nuclear reactors, so she can go a long time without refueling. Carries 128 passengers, and she also carries a helo on board. This icebreaker is so heavy duty that when she breaks ice, you need to know how it's done, she just plows into it. She goes straight into the ice and can break ice up to 10 feet thick. Amazing. Standard icebreakers, conventional ones, ride up on the ice, drop down and break the ice, and then scoot forward, go up under the ice, and drop down again, unless the ice is very thin. This icebreaker doesn't do that at all. It just plows through. And uh, we broke ice up to six or seven feet thick, as you'll see a little later. Um, it was a warm summer, so there was not a lot of heavy duty ice to break. There's the M5 Hilo on the uh, fantail. And there's that aircraft carrier. Now this is the uh, Admiral Knetsov, and the Ruskies just love to parade the ship around, except it's in port all the time. And frequently the ship can't get underway. Her crew is fairly poorly trained. She's got a ski jump uh, bow, as you can see. And she deployed just last year for the first time in years with a heavy escort and a tugboat. The tugboat always escorts the Navy ships from the Russian fleet because they have breakdowns. And oh, the ship sure. deployed to Syria. Some of you may have followed some of her operations in the uh, yeah. just last year. Uh -huh. The Ketsov is beautifully painted, looks great, but doesn't go, go anywhere. <laughs> and she was parked right behind us. And by the way, that's a passenger carrying helicopter. It carries up to about 20 people. And I rode in this uh, at least a half a dozen times. Okay, so there's the Ketsov. You know, let's move on. And so it's now time to uh, get underway. We're, this is the Murmansk River. The tugboats come alongside and pull us out into the river. And there's part of the Russian icebreaker fleet. Wow. Uh, the guy there with a shark's teeth is the Yamal. The Yamal has been to the North Pole more than any other icebreaker in the world. Wow. And she's the one that pioneered civilian travel to the North Pole. She's got a sister ship next to her. And there's two more in front of them and us one of the few times that all five nuclear icebreakers have been in port at the same time. Very, very rare instance. So we scooted right on by, and we saw one of the great Northern Fleet cruisers. This is the um, uh, Peter off or something, Peter something or other, I believe. And anyway, she's just completely covered with missiles and guns and everything else, and she too sits at anchor a lot and doesn't get underway much. As we're heading out into the Arctic Ocean, well, actually the Barents Sea here, we encountered one of the most common, um, she's, she's really not an icebreaker per se, she's an expedition vessel, the Kapitan Kolevnikov. She's conventionally powered, she's chartered by Cork, and she goes to the North Pole a lot. And she also goes all over the Barents Sea and the Bering Sea and does a lot of Arctic and Antarctic trips with paying passengers, and she's just come back from the Northeast Passage, and she's got a bunch of folks on her that are all waving to us, as you can see, and they're asking, we need ice cream, we need ice cream. <laughs> really funny, so that's what she looks like. Um, yeah, but she's conventionally powered, she's, she's not a real icebreaker per se, although she does have that capability.
So one of the benefits of joining this group is that you, you get a heavy duty parka. It's all included in the price tag. So there I am being fitted for my extra heavy duty parka, which has a very thick liner. This has been to the South Pole with me as well, and it, it handled 50 to 60 below zero. Wow. Time, basically. But those were not the kind of temperatures we encountered at all on our trip north. Uh, we had a very interesting cross-section of guests on board this uh, particular cruise. This is a director of one of Hollywood studios on the left. This is uh, the youngest uh, uh, kid on the trip, a 12-year-old, and the director pulls out this 800 millimeter long lens. As you can see, it weighs probably 10 or 15 pounds and <laughs> great for long distance uh, photography. And I'm up on the bridge and folks, here's your first question. What am I looking for? Let's hear it. Anybody? Whales. Whales? Uh, no. What else? Who said ice? Someone said ice. Good job. Thank you for that. Good. Very good answer. Though we're encountering our first pack ice. The ship carries an ice captain in addition to the regular captain or a commanding officer of the ship. His sole job is to find a way through the ice. The goal of the ship is not to break ice if it can be avoided. It's to go around through polynias, which are the openings, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to skirt around uh, them, but it's pretty much a straight dash to the pole. It should take about uh, four, four and a half days. And more ice. And by the way, the sun doesn't go down. We are now up in the area of basically 24-7, and uh, it's just dropped in gorgeous up here. The ice here is maybe two th or three feet thick, and we're just through without any problem at all. And this is four and five foot thick ice here. And then, as I say, the bow just breaks through. And it sounds like a freight train going through your backyard. <laughs> yeah, you feel a little bit of a shudder. You feel the vibrations. But it's a nice, cooling, soothing experience. And since you're going to be going through ice most of the time, you're going to get used to it. Because you're going to go to bed sleeping with that noise in the background. Uh, meals were. Uh, Menu driven, yes, lunches and dinners, you had choices. Beautifully uh, printed uh, menus, as you can see there. And of course, lots of salad and dessert choices and just absolutely first rate decadent food. Including uh, some more samples here, prawn skewers, caramel cream, I mean, this is all high end, great, great food. <laughs> and a lovely white staff, beautiful Russian ladies, all in high heels, yes. No flat shoes for them. They would parade their stuff and take care of our uh, culinary needs very nicely. Wow. Now, the young lady in the uh, uh, seat there with the pinkish colored sweater on, take a good look at her. You're going to see her later. So remember what she looks like. All right, so we uh, are entering King Neptune's realm, as they call it, so they've got to... Um, <coughs> hold court with the guests. And so they uh, put face paint on some of the crew members who are gonna mix with the guests out there on the deck. And uh, there's that director again from that Hollywood studio getting a little bit of lipstick on his nose, part of the ceremony. And out there, the temperature is right around 30 degrees Fahrenheit, just below freezing, no wind, very calm, very pleasant. And the beverage that's served on deck is warm red wine. And it's very delicious, very nice, or tea. So the captain, uh, let's see, our expedition leader is on the far left, and he is a Canadian who has skied across the entire uh, North Pole ice pack before. He went from Canada to Russia on a set of skis. You got the captain on the, next to him with a, something in his hand. You have the interpreter in the white jacket. You have King Neptune in the long green uh, beard and another chap on the far right and they're going through the ritual here of you know, getting us all through the King Neptune's court and there's the refreshments out on the deck as we're plowing through the Arctic ice. Very nice. And the music starts up and we had a multinational crew or a guest uh, list of 14 countries. And this couple here were the first folks I've ever met from Iran. And if you come back here to Ali on the 22nd of April of 2020, I'll be giving a presentation to all of you on my trip through Iran. Mm -hmm. So those two folks there uh, got out on the deck and they were dancing away. And uh, when Facebook came along, would you believe that gal there put me on Facebook as her first friend? I never forget that. So that was sort of neat. 
Uh, we had introduced to the Hilo operations that 20 people at a time would be called by a uh, cabin number and out we would go to hop in the Hilo. And we're flying over the ship gaps, which he looks like breaking ice as we're heading towards the North Pole. <coughs> and again, remember this is a 500 foot long icebreaker. Typical icebreaker is only about 300 feet or less. So this guy is huge. And being nuclear powered, she didn't make any no noise, at least engine wise, and no smoke coming out of her because there's no smoke stack. Yes? The ice captain looks out for some word you use, some breaks in the ice, you use some technical term. Polynias? What? Polynias? Yeah, how do you spell it? Uh Try P O L Y N A Y A. It's close enough. Put that down. <laughs> Those are called leads in the ice. And there, in fact, she's going through a polynary on the edge of one right there. Wow. And there's one of my favorite shots. That's sticking right from the hill. By the way, the windows on that helo are all open. You can stick your head, well, not your head, you can get your arms and your camera right out the window. So, you know, you don't have to shoot through a actual window per se. You reach through the porthole and can get these great shots. Now, these folks here are out on deck. Remember, it's 30 degrees and they're in shorts and t-shirts. <laughs> Why are they so comfortable right here on deck? Here's another question for you. The Anybody want to shining. figure this one out? The sun is shining. Uh, that's a good answer, but not the right one. Oh. <laughs> that's a very good answer. The sun is shining. Yes, the sun is shining, but why? look what's behind them. Oh, the heaters. Oh, the, the heaters. There's the ventilators coming out of the engine room. Yeah. Oh, There's hot air being exhausted, <laughs> and they're just enjoying that moment. <clears throat> We had on board two world-class professors of astronomy, <coughs> pardon me, and uh, they uh, offered lectures. Uh, Rick Feinberg was the outgoing editor of uh, Sky and Telescope magazine, and John Parkinson was a professor of astronomy at Cambridge University. So you had two of the top guys in the world, all both on board, to give lectures on how to view a total solar eclipse, which happened to be a benefit of this trip. The purpose of the trip was to go to the North Pole. But for one extra day at no cost, yeah, 19 days instead of 18 days, we got to dash over to Navaya Zemlaya and get into the path of totality and go watch a total solar eclipse. That's wow. part of this presentation. So an extra bonus, and that was another reason for going. So of course, you have a little bit of dead time. So one of our uh, crew members also was a Tai Chi instructor. And here's class in their small little auditorium and other games and various sports available. Uh, as well. I worked out every day in the gym. And yikes, there I am. Look at that. <laughs> sitting on a uh, little bicycle machine, staring out through a portal, looking for polar bears. <laughs> and holy Christmas, sighted one. There's Big Daddy. Daddy was out there. I didn't take this photo, the guy with the long lens did. But Mom was on the other side of the ship with two cups. Really neat seeing a polar bear in the, the real realm. I mean, this was quite exciting. Wow. And of course, uh, you know, you have to have your socialization time. So not one bar on board. We had two, uh, one forward, one aft. This is my roommate on the right, Denny. I had never met him before. The ship assigned him to me, and we became instant best friends. And when the wait staff in the dining room were off duty, they were allowed to mix with the passengers and even dance with them. And here's Denny dancing with one of the waitresses. So one night was a Russian themed dinner. Yes, ma'am. When you saw that polar bear, were you like looking out at just a, a sea of ice, yes. essentially, and yes. in the middle of it, of no place? Absolutely correct. No other, uh, nothing to see out there except the horizon and 360 degrees of ice. Wow. And by the way, this transit was the best weather transit the captain of this ship had ever made to the North Pole, and he had been there 15 times. We had wow. perfect weather. Yes, we are very fortunate. You're going to see that in the photos. Okay, so here's the Russian-themed dinner. It's all sort of self-explanatory. You'll all recognize the borscht soup in the lower left, all made with real beets, and other themed uh, food here as well. Outstanding job. Let's move on. Okay, and then we had an auction on board. Uh, some of the crew put together a, um, a, a chart, which I, I think you'll see in a moment. Uh, they ordered one special eclipse t-shirt, just one, um, and one um, sweatshirt in the lower left, 
And one crew member painted the ship in oil. And these went for a lot of money. Let's find out. Look at this. There's the chart on the left. It's all been uh, uh, signed by the crew of the ship uh, and the route of the uh, ship going to the North Pole and back. So that's one of a kind. Uh, the uh, polar bear on the right went for $6,000. And she also, the gal with the big smile, paid $25,000 for that chart on the left. So she gets out of there for 31,000, which exceeded the cost of the trip. Her husband was in the audience and didn't blink. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So she, just, she outbid a chap from India, and they went back and forth for a half an hour, outbidding everybody else to get these two items. So she was a happy camper. Does he have a brother? So finally, the announcement was made, folks, get out on the bow of the ship or the forecastle. We're getting near 90 degrees north. We all got our jackets on. And if you look very carefully, you will see right there. See that little sign? That's my sign, 90 degrees north. I always make a sign whenever I go to exotic places. And there's our entire guest uh, group on the bow, photo taken by the ship's photographer from the bridge as we pass 90 degrees north. Do you need proof? Uh, coming up, hang on, there's that sign, and boy, that sign became a big hit. Everybody wanted to be posed with it, so we passed it around for multiple photos, and there's the proof. Wow. GPS, you only go through 90 degrees north for about 10 seconds, and then, you know, the forward part of the ship is past it, the rear of the ship is coming to it, and before you know it, you're all headed south. So that was a big moment right there. 90 degrees north, top of the earth, and very happy to pose with Denny for the photo. So. One pole, one more to go. I had brought with me a very special bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon uh, wine, and we went onto the ice and had a big party. And I, after the party was over, which you're going to see in a moment, I said, holy Christmas, I forgot. We have a bottle of Cabernet on board. We better break that thing out. So we brought it out and uh, enjoyed a, a glass. And I said, you know, let's have a couple of glasses now, and that'll save the other half for tomorrow didn't work that way. <laughs> the bottle disappeared in one city. So when you get to the pole and the, and the ship is stopped in the ice, the, the crew brings out the sign. And of course, <laughs> where is this North Pole? I've got to find out where to put the sign. You know, ha, ha, ha. And this is the setup. This is the world's most northerly picnic. Wow. They, this, remember, the ship's only two months old. So these picnic tables are brand new. They've only been used once. There's the 14 flags, or it should be about that, representing the uh, passengers. They bring out barbecues, they bring out tables, and they are going to serve the most high-end, delicious lunch buffet you have ever attended. And notice the weather. But first, we all have to stand around the North Pole. So we get into the circle, and for the ship's photographer to take our photo, <laughs> and there's the official photo of us at the pole. Now, meanwhile, we've passed through the pole pole's about six kilometers away, and the ice is moving. So you only go through the pole once, and then, you know, you're just moving right. The ship stopped, and you're in the ice, but the ice is moving. So anyway, so we put the uh, marker in the center. But notice the chap. Yeah. Everybody see him? Yeah. What do you think he is? Why is he there? Santa Claus. He's got a gun. Santa Claus. And his two buddies that are at the other two <gasps> points of the triangle to keep the polar bears away. They oh, each got no. high-powered rifles oh, no. because we are in polar bear country, and we don't want them to think of us as a food source. Yeah. <laughs> so there we are, walking around, taking our photos, enjoying our lunch. Beautiful day. It's about 30, 31 <laughs> degrees outside, no wind. And uh, what else are we going to do? Oh, we're going to pose for pictures. So, of course, my sign, their sign. Got my elves hat on, looking for Santa. <laughs> And lo and behold, I reach into my backpack and bring out my sign from the Torrance Party Store. You all know the party store in Torrance where you can get a banner made for 1995. I had this made in advance and I brought this to the North Pole. And of course, I had one made three years later for the South Pole. So I'm very, this is my proof that I've been there. Now, remember that girl at the table for dinner? Remember her in the pink? She came out in a pair of leotards and decided to put on a gymnastics demo. And here she is doing handstands and cartwheels with not much clothing on at the North Pole. 
fantastic show. Ah, but it gets better. Some of these gals from the crew and from the guest list decide to jump on the water. Now the water was open at the stern of the ship, which you'll see in a moment. Ooh. And the gals with the blue towels around their head have already been in. Oh. The three that don't have towels around their head are wannabes. They are thinking about it and uh, may or may not go in, but lovely ladies. Now, everybody take a look at the extra gorgeous one second from the left. The one with the uh, bikini and the light blue uh, bottoms on. I met her in the Antarctic three years later on another cruise. Wow. And uh, we both recognized each other. Her name was Lola. She's the assistant hotel manager for this cruise. First, look at the massive size of the ship, folks. This is the bow. And there's the anchor just sitting on the ice and that chap right there by the tow line or hawser, we call it. And we're going to pretend to tow the ship. So here I am thinking I'm going to make a difference. And I'm sitting on the anchor. So, you know, just photo ops here. They're just incredible. And of course, another chap has to go out there and pretend he's Arnold Palmer. So he brings out his golf club and brings out a couple of white balls and hits them. Oh, yeah. But you can't find them. A white ball will just land in the ice anywhere. And uh, off they went. Where did that ball go? Now, it, the Polar Plunge is available at the stern of the ship, as you can readily see here. They rig up a small little uh, ladder, if you will, or stairway, and they put a big, huge uh, uh, Soviet seaman right here. They, they put a safety line around your waist, and you can jump in or walk in. Most people jump in because you wouldn't want to go in that water slowly. But it's 28 degrees. It's below freezing water, and it's actually um, can be 28, 29 degrees and not freeze. And uh, this guy has already gone in. Most people go in and come out in about 10 seconds or less. But two or three guys actually swam over to the side of the ship and tagged it. And here's a gal jumping in, yippee ki yay, as she's got her safety line on. <coughs> and she's going, whoa, was that cold? As you can see the expression on her face as uh, the seaman is taking the strap off her. And this guy here, perfect jackknife. Oh, and he swam over to the side of the ship and he had no body fat. This guy was about a 90 pound weakling, if you will, as you can see. And there's his expression of oh. having safely returned. Oh. This is very real. Now, what do you get for the privilege and pleasure and honor of having jumped into the Arctic Ocean? The picture. There's the gymnast on the left and that beautiful gal in the bikini, my friend Lola, on the right. Look at that smile. Ooh, gorgeous. You get a shot of Russian Standard Vodka and a, and a membership in the Polar Plunge Club. There you go. So that's what you get for jumping in. Now you're all going to ask me, did you jump in, Rich? And I said, heck no. <laughs> Sorry. I photograph. I don't jump in the water. Crazy people do that. He photographs the people in the water. <laughs> So that's what the ship looks like. Um, you're gonna, some of you are going to ask me, is that water that we're looking at? No, actually, that's the glass sheen of some ice. Um, but I avoided it anyway, because I didn't want to step on that and slide and fall or whatever. But that's what the ship looks like there at the North Pole, right in the middle of the day as we were starting to conduct helo ops. That's a reflection in ice, is what you're saying. Sorry? That's a reflection in ice. At night, yeah, it's 24-7. No, it's ice. No, it's ice. It's ice. It's ice. It's ice. ice. Yeah, that was ice. Yeah, yeah that was actually I ice. Yeah. Sorry, I was, my hearing is a little off. So the helo off started. And another, now, the mat on the stern of the ship, I know you're all dying to know, what is that for? Well, this river is an icebreaker, and 10 months out of the year, it's working as a working vessel for the Soviet government. And it is breaking ice, and behind it is going to be a supply ship or more. And depending upon the thickness of the ice, the uh, ship behind it may be towed or it may be under its own power. But in the event it's towed, it'll bring the bow right up to the stern of the ship. Uh, and that's what the match for is to protect the stern of the icebreaker from the bow of the towed vessel. Wow. So that mat is there just to keep the other guy from doing damage in the event that your tow is right behind you. So here's the, here's the barbecue menu, just been freshly printed. Lots of choices, more food than you could possibly eat. <clears throat> and there's my first plateful. <laughs> the, way, the way staff came out on the tables there and uh, just piled everything onto your plate. 
And that's the picture from the ship of our incredible barbecue uh, and buffet lunch at the North Pole. So, let's go take a Hilo ride. And there's a gorgeous shot taken from a Hilo that I took looking down at this giant icon of Soviet engineering. Well, after so much fun in the sun and on the ice, it's time to go home or at least get back on the ship. So we're saying farewell. And who do we run into a half a day away but the Yamal? This was a surprise visit. We were not expecting the Yamal to be coming to the North Pole in addition to our ship. Normally, it's only one icebreaker gets the duty. But in this particular case, the Yamal uh, passed us up. And take a look how many times she's been to the pole. I won't read all these to you. You can see it. 43 times she's been there. That's over a period of about 15, almost well, probably 20 years. Typical would be two trips maybe per summer. Uh, we had one guy on board, a knighted gentleman from England, Sir Chichester. And Sir Chichester was on board uh, for his seventh trip to the North Pole. Six of them were on the Yamal. Notice when the Yamal was built way back in 93, she's uh, about 50, 60 feet shorter. A little smaller in size. Also twin nuclear reactor and lots of power. And you can never miss her, folks, because she's got the shark's teeth. Mm. And there she is, breaking ice. <clears throat> ah, I love this shot. That's really neat. Yeah, these are, these are, these, this is real action time. Now, it's time to go bump into icebergs. Well, normally, you want to avoid icebergs. You know, the Titanic had a very fateful uh, collision with one and didn't survive. And you would think an icebreaker would just ignore icebergs. Well, our captain decided, no, I'm not gonna ignore one. I'm gonna actually go look for one and bump into it. Let's go push an iceberg around. And we did. If you see an iceberg, you know right away it only comes from one place, Greenland. And they all come from Greenland. They don't come from anywhere else up there. And this guy here, and here we are with a bow up against this huge iceberg, and we're pushing it around the ocean. Now, there are not too many ships that, that could or would do that, but we sure did. But look at her as she went down the side of the ship. Absolutely dropped down. Wow, that's a beautiful shot. And I love this one because of the perspective. You got everybody on the starboard side, cameras out, watching the iceberg go down the side of the ship. Neat photo op. So now we're going to go land on a um, very remote archipelago of islands called Franz Josef Land. I never figured in my wildest imagination I would ever go to this place. 50 some odd islands. Here they are, I've named the number of them for you, and the arrows point to where we made landings. We made landings on four of these islands by helicopter. This area has been occupied by the Ruskies, the Soviets for many years, weather stations, and mainly that. And they gave it all up after the fall of the wall, and then these islands became totally uninhabited. And then just recently, they reset up another weather station couple of science stations here. Let's go take a look. So here we are on Ziegler Island, Franz Joseph Land. And this is the site of a recent movie shoot. The um, <clears throat> movie company from Russia came up here and set up shop and went ahead and did some uh, uh, photographing for a movie. And they left their slides behind. They left their empty fuel barrels behind. Mm -hmm. They didn't take it with them. At least they didn't leave a mess but they did leave a lot of stuff behind. No, and we were warned, don't go out into the box. This is the area, right, remember the temperature's right around freezing. And in the summertime, some of that bog stuff, the peak, the uh, permafrost will actually start melting on you. You step in it, you might not get out. Oh. This gal on the right ignored the briefing, safety procedures, stepped into the mud and got stuck and couldn't get out. So a crew member had to go find a board and then walk out and rescue her and she lost a boot in the process. Huh. Yeah. It sucked right off her foot. It's real. <clears throat> it happened right here. And I happened to nail it. Um, anyway, she paid a, a lot of embarrassment. The boots were provided by the ship, by the way. <laughs> yes, even during their brief summers, there are some flowers that bloom up there. These are very small, very short season, but they're very pretty. So we go over by Rubini Rock. Rubini Rock is a big, huge promontory, if you will, or island just off the coast of a big abandoned weather station. But what's really neat is what's on the other side. Mm -hmm. Walls of birds. 
And these are terns and, and uh, all kinds of different Arctic birds. And the captain pushed the boat or the vessel right up against, almost up against the Rubini rock to, to, so we could take pictures. The polar bears come along right up to the edge of that wall and try to grab birds. But. So here's on the other side of Rubini Rock is, of course, the uh, Takaya Bukta uh, abandoned weather station here on uh, Hooker Island. So we're going to go ashore by Hilo. And one chap back in the 1920s died here, so his grave is there. And there's the, uh, the old windmill. They actually had an aircraft here at one time. I don't know how it landed, but this is what's left of the fuselage. Notice the guy's carrying a gun. Yeah, we've got crew members out there again providing that big triangle around all the guests to keep the polar bears away. And the kennels for those dogs that were there, the sled dogs, are still there, including their water and food dishes still outside the entrances. A little more uh, flora here, local color. And barrels of a white substance that we never could figure out what it was. It looked like salt. It could have it sort of felt like flour. I asked the members of the expedition team what it was, and they only had a clue. Mm. Uh, right about this point here on the other side of those two people, a walrus stuck his head up. First and only walrus I saw on the expedition. And he was up and down in no time. No one had a chance to photograph it. But at least we did see a walrus. And, um, a well boat that had been abandoned for since the 20s and just sitting there. An outhouse with a view, <laughs> in case you want to do your thing with a little bit of scenery. Uh, the living quarters here on the right in one of their prefab buildings still is utilized today. Once a year, a, a team of Russian scientists will come out to this site and hold a two or three day conference and they do it in this building. They've got to clear out all the ice and Ooh. throw their sleeping bags down on the cots and have their little seminar. Wow. The remnants of an old Russian tractor. This kind of stuff for me is just fascinating. I mean, this is an abandoned research station, a weather station, or whatever. It's been closed since probably the 60s or 50s. Now, this is a large hangar, but we were wondering, did it hold an airplane? Probably not, because there's no door big enough to accommodate an airplane. So it's filled with snow and ice, and maybe it was just used for supplies. Well, who knows? And I said, I talked about prefab. All the buildings are prefab, and you build them like Lincoln logs by the numbers. And there's the numbers. You can see them. So it arrives by a Russian research or a Russian supply vessel in a big pile of lumber. You take out your, your blueprints and your, your guide map, and you put the numbers together. And before you know it, you got yourself a, a prefab hut. What's the flag? The flag is the Russian flag. Mm -hmm. Flag of Russia. By the way, um, easy to remember because that's the same combination as Holland and France. Remember, Russia's white stripe is on the top. Otherwise, you're going to be saying, oh, that's the flag of Holland. No, that's the French flag. No, it's not. That's the <laughs> so the fog moved in, and we're stuck on the island, and we're all wondering, how are we going to get back to the ship? The Hilo can't fly. The captain on the ship said, simple, I'll move the ship. And he moved the ship closer to shore, and this is, we got close enough so we could Hilo back. Then we move on to Wilsack Island, and I'm pointing to where we're going. Take a look, way up there. There is a geological marker up there, and that's where I'm headed. Do a little exploring here. Bingo, we got a survey stand, that's where we're at, and there's the marker right there. I know, Russians put it in, whatever, I couldn't read it. And the snow bunny on the right decided she wants to go down the side of the ice and snow and do a little <laughs> glissading. More colorful vegetation on the left. Now, the chap on the right has picked up a pair of antlers. Now, we have reindeer and caribou. This is reindeer country, but there's no reindeer here. The reindeer were brought here by Norwegians who brought this set of antlers because there are no indigenous reindeer on these islands. And he's putting them on his head. And Three years later, I'm on another cruise in the South Pacific, and guess who I run into? Uh, <laughs> this guy. The horn yes. Guy. He started dating one of the other guests and wound up proposing to her, and the two of them were married when I ran into him three years ago. Three years <laughs> later. Amazing. So we're off to another island. This is Hall Island, and we're going to go check out this cape. And we're headed for this notch and this really 
funny, very uh, interesting looking rock formation. We're going to walk across this icy field very gingerly, very treacherous, and up to the notch where this was placed by an Italian research team just a few years earlier, leaving a Madonna and Child icon behind. And what fascinated me is we got to go over to a remote section of the island where a uh, former encampment was found. And this was set up by a couple of icebound ships in 1898. And they were stuck here for two years. And so they went ashore and set up this shelter. That's the stove in the center that I'm looking at. And you can see what the weather and time has done to the building. It's just dilapidated. But this is where they lived for two and a half years until rescued in 1900. Fascinating. And this is what it looked like just turning around, looking into the interior. Remote, rugged, icy, with a little bit of color. So our final helo flight. But every time you go back and forth on and off the ship, you always have to wash your boots. You don't want to bring back any species or, or um, bugs or or uh, spores or bacteria or whatever onto the ship and you don't want to take any off the ship with you going ashore so you wash your boots in both directions just a standard procedure and we do that on all the research vessels going in and out of the arctic and the Antarctic. so there we were up there at the uh, north pole we just visited trans joseph land and now it's time to make a dash over to Novaya zemlaya to go look for a total solar eclipse so it's Teller Eclipse Day, and notice we've got our first clouds. And half our passengers are on the trip for the eclipse, and the other half are on board for the North Pole. Of course, everybody got both. So you got amateurs, me, and you got pros, and the other half of the group, and they were given the aft half of the ship to go watch the solar eclipse. And the amateurs were given the forward part, because our protocols were different. We basically, amateurs, don't know what we're doing, and the pros do know what they're doing, and they set up their tripods, and they are quiet, and they know how to aim their cameras, and so it was all set up that way very intentionally. So we put up the uh, eclipse flag. Here's yours truly on the forward part of the ship, getting ready, I've got my glasses on, getting ready to watch the uh, solar eclipse start. Uh, this is the chap that you saw earlier with the reindeer. Remember the reindeer antlers? Yeah. This is the same guy, he's a pro, and notice he's got multiple tripods and multiple cameras, and he took those to the South Pacific when he proposed to his girlfriend. And he has been, I think at this point, on at least 14 or so total solar eclipses. And there's only an average of one every year or two, so he's been doing this a while. He's from Germany. And more amateurs. And voila, we have cloud cover. Uh-oh, are we gonna see the total solar eclipse? The astronomer turns to the captain and said, Captain, you've got to turn this ship around and go over there to go get in position for the total solar eclipse, which starts in about 10 minutes. And the captain turned back to Rick and said, I'm sorry, but Murmansk is that way, and I ain't going to get back to Murmansk in time, so <coughs> we're going to have to turn around here. And Rick says, uh, Captain, you're mistaken. Murmansk is actually that way. Scoot. And the ship went into high speed at 21 knots and took off. And we started heading for the opening, hopefully, in the clouds, and there it was. We just got an opening. The total solar eclipse, is, that's the first phase, is just starting. And then the penumbra catches up with us. It gets darker. Now, you're going to say it got very quiet. No, it was already quiet. There's no birds chirping out there. And uh, the, the shadow engulfed us for a, uh, about two and a half minutes. And there is the diamond ring. I did not take this photo, taken by a pro. Very spectacular. It's dark and it's just unbelievable. Now there's the diamond ring. Does it look like a diamond ring, ladies? Yes, it does. And Bailey's beads. Now what is a Bailey's bead? That's a little glimpse of light passing through a valley on the moon. Remember, the moon is blocking the sun, and that's what you're seeing is you're looking at the moon with the sun behind it. Well, if you've got a valley, which is a cutout, on the moon, a little bit of sun is going to pass through, right? That's a Bailey's beam, and we nailed it. Very exciting. And that's totality. Mm. Two and a half minutes of darkness. Mm. It doesn't get any more exciting than this. And this is my first one. Mm. First of August, 2008. 
So this is the expression of one of our guests, one of the amateurs, as his mouth goes open and he's going, ah. You know, he was very excited as he watched all this take place. And then totality starts to disappear. The ring appears on the other side and now you're gonna get daylight again. And of course, here's our uh, lovely ladies, um, spouses of some of the other guests and they're out there in the amateur section again, looking with their various uh, special productive lenses, enjoying the moment. As the uh, totality was passing through, one of the fun things you do is you take your hands and you cross them like this, and you can get an image on the right side there, uh, looking as the uh, sun is not quite come out from behind the moon. And it's part of the grating, which you see above me, right up there. The sun and light is passing through that and imaging onto the back of my shirt. Again, partial um, moon uh, cutouts. So we're dashing at full speed back to Murmansk. We've got to make it back to the river and our berth at high tide. Can't get in in a low tide. This is why we had to scoot through uh, the coastal section of Novaya Zemlya. By the way, that is the proving ground for all their hydrogen bombs. The Ruskies, when they set off, uh, many years ago, lots of their testing of nuclear weapons, they did it in Novaya Zemlya. They were one of the few ships that have gotten within 50 miles of the coast. Here we are again, scooting back into our berth. Notice the Admiral Knetsov is still parked there behind us. And it's our final dinner, and the ladies, our wait staff, are coming out with incredible fire. These are real fireworks. These are Roman candles stuck in the middle of cakes. Oh, and I mean, it, this is... You, you wouldn't get away with this in the U.S. The fire marshal would be having a conniption. But uh, they, they really put on a spectacular show for us. And this is my illegal photo. Remember the ground rule? No photos of the ship from the pier. They said that rule went away. You can now take photos. And there's Bo, and Bo right there be, became one of my best friends, and you've seen him before. He went to Iran with me, he went through the Northwest Passage with me, he went up the west coast of Africa with me. Uh, we watched the total solar eclipse in Oregon a year ago. Uh, Bo and I have traveled the world, including he was my roommate or tent mate in the South Pole trip. So uh, this trip here really set the precedent for Bo and I to do some serious international travel. That's his wife right in front of him. Unfortunately, she's uh, uh, an, almost an invalid and can no longer travel, but Bo still can. And our final check of our visas, we're leaving Russia and no more guards and we're getting on this plane and the second we hop on the 737, we're in freedom time and we're going to fly from Murmansk back to um, Finland. So there's the trip highlights, you can see that for yourself. We set a new record for the ship, got to the pole in only four and a half days, that was really neat. Yeah, we saw various animals as you can notice, the four islands in France Joseph Land. And folks, this was a trip of a lifetime. I think that's it. Thank you very much. So that was an exciting trip, and that, that led me to go and do it all now down south three years later. We happy to entertain any questions. Unless you're all questioned up. Yes, ma'am. One island that had that peak. Why was it shaped like that? Uh, just geological formation over time. I'm sure ice and wind all caused that carving out. Mother Nature better find us. Anybody else? Is this thing still working? Yes, sir. Anybody else? The north and the south pole, which is more spectacular in your opinion? Um, which is more spectacular, the north or south pole? Actually, I would say probably the South Pole because we've got buildings there. We have people there. We have research stations there. Um, and it's also an awful lot colder and very difficult to get to and two and a half times the expense. So it's, uh, yeah, the South Pole is extremely difficult to get to. And uh, therefore, it's, it's more of a special honor and privilege to, to get there. But uh, when I was there, it was 55 below zero, and it was so cold. Thanks again, folks. You've been a great audience. Come back on the 22nd of April.